conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and I am joined today by Katie Schaefer. We are talking all about Uncanny X-Force by Rick Remender and so many artists, apparently. And this was a 37-issue run. I thought it was 35 because I didn't realize there were 2.1 issues in it. But Katie, you suggested this a while ago. Yes. And I finally got around to it because I had read the first, like, seven issues apparently when we were initially going to try to do it right and then i just then stephen king took over your life again probably yeah probably that is the most likely scenario it was probably like oh i have to read under the dome now okay (laughs) yeah it would be right about that time i would say probably so and then there's like two other really long ones after that yeah that and shortly followed by eleven twenty two sixty three. So oh, God, <laughs> that was a brutal right. stretch. Tomes. But this volume has five different storylines. The final execution being the last one and the longest of the storylines. Here's the thing. I enjoyed the story aspect of Uncanny X-Force. And I thought it was really cool that they were using Psylocke, Phantom X, Deadpool, Wolverine, and... First Angel, then Archangel, and so on. So we have a few lineup changes. You see some other characters later, a bunch of other characters later. I am so bad with X-Men books because there's usually too many characters. And I'm like, I don't remember who you are. Oh, my God. There's so many. And in this one, there are so many. And a lot of them are not obscure necessarily, but not ones that we see a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, even like Phantom X. I didn't know anything about that character going into this. Right. And I knew of him when I read this. And thankfully, my husband is very well read on the X-Men books. So anytime I had a question, I was like, okay, how did we get here? What's going on with this? And he'd be like, (laughs) okay, well, I'm just going to give you the quick rundown. And then it'd be like 10 minutes of explanation. By the end, I'd be like, all right, now I have five new comics to read. (laughs) Yeah, that's the thing, too. Avengers... I can kind of keep better track of. Just because, to be fair, a lot of the Avengers don't have like a ton of different power sets, I guess, if you will. Like all the spider right. people have roughly the same power. So whether it's Jessica Drew or Peter Parker joining the Avengers for something, you know, Black Widow and Hawkeye don't have powers. So it's yeah. a little easier to keep everyone straight in the Avengers. And, you know, one looks like the Hulk. he's all green and stuff and sometimes he might be gray yeah but with the x-men because they're all in their uniforms most of the time yes (laughs) so it makes it so much harder i'm like is this the same woman that we just saw or is this someone else yes yeah and the uniforms depending i mean in this book they're all pretty different but yeah that is such an issue with x-men because it's they always run to a theme Mm -hmm. it feels like um so it's only the ones who are very distinctive looking that you know immediately especially because x-men it is not unusual for artists to change just like in this one, just constantly. There's so many artists artists yeah. that are in this. It's like, okay, you know, I got Wolverine down, Cyclops, Storm. You know, yeah. <laughs> there, there's a handful that I'm just like, I know who these people are. Iceman, pretty easy. <laughs> yep, yep. And I know Nightcrawler. I mean, yeah. I know a lot yeah. of them because I've been, yes, exactly. I've been reading X-Men since, I think that was one of the first comics I started reading like almost 20 years ago now. And I have read a lot of it and some more obscure stuff. So, but even for me, there were characters in this. I was like, I have no idea who that is. Oh shit. That's Wolverine's son. You know, (laughs) like, oh crap. This this is crazy. Right. And I don't know anything about the X-Men storyline leading up to this or after this. I just went, I'm going to read this. I'm going to hope I understand context. And the first storyline, the apocalypse solution, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. They're, going to go kill Apocalypse. And they don't understand that Apocalypse isn't one specific person. It's sort of this thing that exists within multiple people, but can only, you know, come out one person at a time, kind of. And only under, it's circumstantial. 
Yes. The person who is able to meet, like, it's like almost like a board game where we're all playing the board game of who gets to be Apocalypse, so the one that no one wants to win, where once you meet these, you know, victory conditions, you're Apocalypse now, you know? Um, and I thought they did a decent job of explaining that mm -hmm. in this fairly early on, so you weren't like, huh? I was still kind of like that at times, but <laughs> it's okay. Not necessarily with that storyline, but more so as we continue with Deathlock Nation, the Dark Angel Saga, Other World, and Final Execution. So those yeah. are the five storylines there. And Phantom X plays a huge role in this that I wasn't expecting because anytime you have a team like this, you're kind of expecting it to be with you know, focused on the characters we already know, like Wolverine. And sure, we do get a lot of that character, but yeah, a lot of it has to do with, especially at the beginning, like the Psylocke and Angel love story kind of thing, him changing and Phantom X killing a child, and then everyone sort of trying to cope with that. And Deadpool, always good for some comedic relief, but then he tries to be serious and everyone's just like, this is what you call this in for? <laughs> Deadpool is, he's not a huge part of the story, which I like. Like, I like how much Deadpool we get in this because he's used, yeah. like, like salt. He's, he seasons it, but he's not the overwhelming flavor because that's not necessarily what you want from this kind of story. But I love how he sets things in motion and makes very, he makes very different decisions than you might expect it's still within character because Deadpool can be um, so off the wall at times, but I think it adds a certain um, sincerity to the book. Mm -hmm. And I like how adult this, this one is where it, this is not something I would encourage a child to read in any way, shape or form, not just because of the, you know, there's a brutal murder of a child in like the first issue or second issue or whatever, but because all of the themes that it's talking about are things that, like, a 12-year-old isn't really going to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Like, all these X-Men are early to mid-30s at least. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we touched on how many artists were on this series. And in 37 issues, they had seven different artists. All of whom do a great job, I have to say. I didn't love... <laughs> Oh, the face. <laughs> the face. Okay. I didn't love Greg Tuccini's art. Mm. It was just in comparison to everyone else, it was a little too drastically different because it wasn't as clean as the stuff we saw from Mark Brooks or Phil Noto. I think Phil Noto is definitely my favorite artist on this series. Not that I think any of the others particularly do things that I don't like. Like, Mm -hmm. So when we start and you have Jerome Opeña and Isad Ribic, and, you know, I love Raphael Albuquerque's art. Yes, I do too. It is a little different, but because that was sort of for that 5.1 or 5.5 issue, whatever it was, it was kind of just a one-off. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think Phil Noto does a really, really great job. Yeah, the art is not equal amongst all of it. You know, it's not all it's amazing, but... It is all interesting. And that's definitely yeah. what I'm looking for from this kind of book. Yeah. So it jumps around a lot because then you have Opeña started on issues one through four. Then you had someone else doing five through seven and some of the other issues. And then Opeña came back for 14 through 18. So I think it's not necessarily just because there were different artists for like each story arc, which would have made more sense, like if you wanted to have five different artists on each, you know, one for each story arc, but it jumped around a lot. Because like Phil Noto did issue 24, but did not do 25, then did 26 and 27 and 31 through 34. So it was kind of like, okay, this is a little too much change. Because yes, there were only six artists, seven artists, but they kept jumping around <laughs> so much. Yeah, it, it really is incredibly varied and you never really know what you're going to get from yeah. issue to issue. Like it's, you turn the page and you're like, oh, wow, okay, different. And then, you know, like you said, the next issue, oh, we're back there again, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it's Like if they would have just done it by storyline, that would have been easier, but it's like yeah. mid storyline, they're changing artists and I'm like, hold on. 
<laughs> I wonder I wonder what the story is behind this. I bet there's a very interesting like the production story I bet is fascinating cuz I mean yeah. the, f- the weird thing is is uh, you know Remender got wasn't it like 2 years on this comic? Like he went for quite a while and had a decent run. I think it would have had to be 3 years if it was 37 issues cuz I think it was a monthly comic. Yeah, I think so too. Hang on. I will I am on the Wikipedia page. I can tell us. <laughs> Cuz it ran October 2010 to December 2012. So, a little over 2 years. I can like that's a yeah. long time and this is such a complicated story and the thing I most liked about it is that the apocalypse solution threads itself throughout the entire book and there are times where in other world and final execution it's kind of a, a little bit of a reason but it's not until about halfway through final execution, I think it is, that we see that come back into it. And, you know, the whole end of it is all wrapped up in it. So I really enjoyed that storytelling skill. And it, like you said, it takes us all over the place. Like you see, there are so many locations in this. Like, what is is there? Yeah. Are we in three different multiverse locations? Because it's the regular it's so many. The world. <laughs> right. The, oh, no, it's got to be at least four because then there's Ava, Phantom X's place. And yeah. they, we go to Age of Apocalypse Land, which I imagine is both very expensive and just the worst theme park in the world. And then Other World. Yep. Yep. Which that one was totally new for me. I didn't know much about Captain Britain or the Captain Britain Corps. So uh, that was like, oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. So- sounds British. <laughs> I had heard of Captain Britain before, but yes. like yes. you did not know anything really. Like that he's Psylocke's brother. Yeah. Because I, I was like, like, oh, another Braddock. Okay. I mean, that's common enough, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of family members in this that I did not know about. Yeah. And and it, do you think it's pronounced Dokken or Dakin? I prefer to think Dokken because that 80s band was both. <laughs> terrible and delicious at the same time we're going with Dokken. we're going with Doc. excellent i was hoping you, i was hoping you'd be with me on this um and i'm yeah i he comes into it and i like i said i had um like the annotated edition of this because i could just be like who's this what's what's going on with this guy oh that's so and so and blah 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 blah, blah. it's like okay great now I'll go back and I know what I'm reading. So what was it like for you reading that where you didn't have that like Wikipedia, that walking Wikipedia for, for help? <laughs> I was struggling a little with this one. And like I said, at the top of the episode, X-Men has kind of always been like that for me, just because they do use so, so many characters over the years. And this one has, like you said, ones that aren't used as often. But once we got to the Farouk storyline, mm-hmm. because I had watched Legion, I was very familiar with that character. So I didn't necessarily read too much of him in the comics because when Legion aired, I did read one of the Legion comics. I don't remember which one it was, but that had a lot more to do with Legion than Farouk for sure. So to see that character pop up here, I was like, oh, it really feels like they're doing something different with this comic. And you can tell because even when we get the whole Age of Apocalypse storyline and we see that Jean Grey, yeah, it's just, it's not the same, you know? It's mm-hmm. obvious this Jean has gone through a lot of stuff that the Jean of X-Force's world didn't go through. Sure, she went through di- <laughs> much right. different things, but it right. was... Nice to see how they use the characters in different ways. And they do that with Nightcrawler, too. And we have the whole Mystique storyline as well. And Mm -hmm. the way they changed up the characters, I did enjoy that. But again, it was still a lot to keep track of. One thing I both really enjoy and can find frustrating about X-Men is that it's, it's one of those things where they're like... 
yeah, well, we're going to pull shit out of like 30 years ago. And if you don't know, well, you'll have to figure it out. Like they are not afraid to do that. And also throw in entirely new curveballs that like no one has ever seen before and act like, oh, well, everybody knows about that. What are you talking about? But within the characters, like the characters are not surprised as if they've known about this forever. So it's it, it can be intimidating for me when I start a new X run I'm like mm, okay there's gonna have to be a whole lot of just like don't know what that means just keep going don't know what that means just keep going yeah and I found myself not really liking Dr. McCoy in this which felt weird mm -hmm. I know because Beast is usually so likable but most of the Beast that we see in this is the evil have you ever read Age of Apocalypse? No. Okay. All of the Age of Apocalypse characters are have been set up before in a mm -hmm. lot of comics. Yeah. And I think at least some of the second TV show. But anyway, they... Um, so yeah, he's like the evil Dr. McCoy. And he uses all of the cunning and in academic brain and uh, strategic thinking that good Dr. McCoy has, but uses it for evil. And it's a little freaky with how uh like just conscious he has no conscience whatsoever yeah and then they're interacting with their future selves at yeah some point, oh god and psylocke tries to kill herself basically and future her has to stop her <laughs> and it's just this whole thing and you have genesis also known as Evan, coming into this. And it's like he's being trained to be the next apocalypse. So Right. Well, he's the interesting thing is he's the clone of the kid that Phantom X killed. Right. He was going to become Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. But Phantom X clones a copy of him because he feels so bad in his own little, like, mini world that he can go into. And then the kid Genesis gets kidnapped by, uh, like, moon monks. Something on the moon. I can't remember their exact name, but they, <laughs> and so then he's becoming, they're trying to make him become Apocalypse. And that's where like, yeah, the weird, you get the much more in-depth explanation of that, like, well, just because he has the same DNA as old Apocalypse doesn't necessarily mean that that's what he's going to become. He is right. likely, he has a higher chance of it, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah. And so you have that whole thing where... Gateway is killed. You have just oh. so much going on. You have Phantom X being triplicated. <laughs> yep. Yep. Because he dies and then is cloned or brought back to life. Like it's that that part was a little. What? What? Yeah. Because they do kind of try to explain that he has three brains. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So then it's basically like Deadpool was screwing around and was like, this is taking too long. So I'm just going to hit some buttons. Yes. <laughs> Which okay, thanks. Of thanks. course, <laughs> Deadpool, you're doing good, doing great, doing great. And you know, you have the three come out of the machine or whatever, and it's like, oh, okay. And that's so close to the end. You're just like, all right, you're just gonna leave us with this. That's fine, <laughs> right? Right. Well, there is a second graphic novel of this. Yeah, that's uh, about the same size, and it gets even weirder, even weirder. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's my struggle with X-Men a lot of the times, too, is that some of the storylines are so out there. You know, not everything is Dark Phoenix, Age of Apocalypse, so on and so forth. Like, you've probably heard of all of the major X-Men storylines, especially all the ones that were adapted into movies, obviously. I'm a little more familiar with those, regardless of having not read the comics in right. most instances. But when you're getting into all of these offshoots, because there are so many X-Men books, it's never just X-Men or Uncanny X-Men. Like, this is Uncanny X-Force, and then now you have mm -hmm. red, blue, gold, I don't know how many. There's always a minimum of, like, five <laughs> to six, like, group comics, and then individuals will have their own story, depending on what Marvel is allowing writers to do at the time. The longest-running one is Uncanny X-Men. Right. And that's, like... The, the main storyline generally. And I've read quite a bit of that one on and off throughout the years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but a lot of the characters in this that are not one of like the big five are often shunted off into something like this where it's like, oh, well, 
let's tell a more uh, complex story, like how Angel and Archangel are used in this are, is uh, kind of heartbreaking, like his relationship yeah. with Psylocke and like he's losing his mind. Yeah, there's so much going on here. And just a quick note. So you have obviously the very first original Stanley X-Men run. And then when you hit the Claremont era, which is when a lot of these big, massive storylines happened, you had Uncanny X-Men, X-Factor, Excalibur, and New Mutants. Mm -hmm. Then in the 90s, you have Uncanny, X-Men, X-Force, Generation X, X-Factor, yep. <laughs> and Excalibur. That's just so much. And I think Excalibur, I believe, is where Captain Britain comes from. Because I think yes. that's the yeah. that's the British. It's the British team, and then who you hit the Grant Morrison era. Oh God, yeah. New X Men, Uncanny X Men, Extreme X Men, New Mutants, X Statics, NYX, and Weapon X. NYX was the first comic book series I ever purchased and read on my own. Oh, it that's was fun. It was written by Joe Casita, who is okay up yeah. until very recently, and maybe still is. I think he was talking about retiring. He's the head of Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. It's much more like indie movie with mutants rather than like superhero story. Yeah. And then eventually you get Astonishing X-Men, all new X-Men, Amazing X-Men. So, so many different X-Men books. Mm -hmm. Most of them with and some of them like NYX have no characters that you know. They're just about different mutants. Yeah. And now it's even wilder since you know the jonathan hickman stuff they had x-men marauders excalibur new mutants fallen angels x-force a wolverine title hellions cable x-factor so many and i know for a fact at least a couple of years ago the ongoing storyline had both um future x-men and uh their themselves uh, from like alternate dimension in the same timeline yeah and all the mutants like there's a whole like <laughs> extinction event that's happened like yeah it's insane what's been going on in the x series i have to give marvel credit though because i cannot imagine internally keeping all of that straight uh, they've got to have like a, a historian job you're x-men historian yeah someone will come to you and you have read and cataloged all the information in all the x-men <laughs> yeah i mean i know the x-men has its own like office within Marvel because mm -hmm. people will always talk about the X Men office, like creators who work on those books and stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, they need a whole team of people to keep that one straight because mm -hmm. I certainly can't. And I feel like I wouldn't say this is a good place to start if you're new to X Men. Like, I at least had some familiarity and I, you know, did an X Men episode semi recently that was kind of some a random set of a few issues like one was with dracula and yes you know they have a lot of wacky stuff that you can kind of just dip into and dip out of and you can also just start with you know those big storylines that we already mentioned but uncanny x-force is just so unique in the way that they're letting them play with these characters and i think rick remender is someone who I feel like is a little more hit or miss for me. I think he has this comic book called Low. And I've heard of that, but never read it. This is, I think, the yeah. only thing I've ever read by him. I read, I want to say, the first trade of that. And I didn't necessarily love it. But I do have Fear Agent sitting on my shelf waiting to be read because I think there's just something about his work and that is something that Opeña also worked with on him fear agent oh yeah he seems to have like repeat artists that he works with yeah so it seems like this was kind of a collection of that so low and black science i think are two that i tried and didn't find myself getting into but the big thing of his that i enjoy and i've still only read the first trade of it deadly class Oh, interesting. I'll have to give that one a try. Yeah, he also apparently was the lead writer on the Epic Games uh, Bullet Storm, which I was like both, like, okay, I can see that. That game was sure yeah. something. Ugh. And he's done uh. lots of other 
Marvel stuff. He's done Punisher stuff. He has done, you know, a Cap. what if issue. Yeah, he's a he's a wide ranging author. Yeah, that is for sure. And he's done so many Marvel things that it's just like sometimes it'll be like an issue here or there, and then you know he did some Uncanny Avenger stuff and. He's done all sorts of stuff with different publishers. So there's a lot of Rick Remender to consume out there, but I think I'll talk about one of those a little more for recommendations. But overall, like I said, I thought the story was good. The jump in art was a little too often for my liking when you're changing artists every like four issues. It can be a bit jarring. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of my biggest complaint about this. But I am glad I read it because it definitely clued me into some characters that I didn't know about before this. Yeah, and characters that are hinting at different stories. Like the, I haven't read it yet, but the story about uh, Wolverine's son is pretty fascinating from what I've heard. And Phantom X's earlier stuff is supposed to be pretty good. He has some good writers on his work or on his, his books, like... There's a lot going on here, and it all kinds of leads to a bunch of other storylines, which is one of the great things about X Men is you'll never run out of X Men to read at this in this stage in life anyway. But I think, like you said, it's not for the beginner. It is not for someone who like, oh, I really like you know the animated X Men series. Let's start reading comics or whatever yeah. the case may be. Like this will just be, it'd be like trying to watch you know the seventh Harry Potter movie. <laughs> And you don't, and you have never even heard of Harry Potter. You don't even know anything about it yeah. whatsoever, and it just throws you in the deep end of "Here you go, have some fun." Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I maybe wasn't quite at the point where I should have read this, but I think I had <laughs> enough backstory to make that work. Because I will say, Apocalypse, the only X Men movie I still have not seen. I mean, that would not have helped you here. By in any way, shape, or form, but I think it would have helped a little with getting to know some of the characters a little more. Because isn't isn't Psylocke in that quite a bit? I think so because I think she gets cast as one of his four horsemen in that one. But like, yeah, it, it that movie is it's rough. So I've heard. I maintain that there's a good movie in there. They shot a good movie. They just did not edit a good movie like there was so much opportunity the cast was good the special effects are decent and like we could have learned about these characters but instead it's just incredibly poorly put together and designed and oscar isaac while doing his best is given nothing to work with so like you really don't learn a whole lot about about any of it you're just kind of told and then we move on and then action scene i see so so it's kind of like dark phoenix Yes, I would say it's in that frame of X-Men movies, because I think, is it that one and then Days of Future Past? Uh, Isn't it Apocalypse, then Days of Future Past, then Dark Phoenix? Or did Days of Future Past come before? I think it was before those two, because I think Apocalypse was the latest one that I had not seen, and then I saw Dark Phoenix for the podcast, which I will never watch that again. (laughs) No, it's so bad. But yeah, it's that kind of movie where... Like, if you are watching it to get information on what happens in the Age of Apocalypse comic book, you have come to the wrong place. (laughs) Just, what? (laughs) Yeah. I think, oddly enough in this, Phantom X might have been my favorite character. He is just a great anti-hero. I really enjoyed that part of it. That he's Because he's not entirely likable. He's not like Deadpool, where Deadpool is just, like, kind of adorable in some ways. But there's a lot going on with the character, so I think it kept Phantom X more interesting throughout it, especially, right. you know, with those clones at the end and the whole three brain thing. And, you know, even they were like, oh, I'm surprised he's not worse. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Like, the, it's there's a lot to unpack with yeah. Phantom X. And Reminder is really good at giving you just little bits, little bits here and there playing out this character, like... Does he actually care about Psylocke? Sometimes you think yes. Sometimes you think no. Like there's a whole lot of um, questions and he Mm -hmm. is not, he is very opaque. And you can't trust what he says beyond that either, even though he's ostensibly a good guy. And I did enjoy it. I've read, I've read more books with Psylocke, but I think, think she probably was my favorite. 
because you get to see her in a lot of emotional situations Mm -hmm. and she gets to express herself so much. So I was pleased with the kind of character growth that we get for Psylocke and Phantom X in this and to a certain extent a couple of the other characters but they're really kind of the big the big two of this of this book yeah absolutely and you know I think if you're familiar enough check this out if not uh, hopefully we did an okay job talking about it there was a lot to unpack here and I really did enjoy a lot of the Shadow King Farouk stuff just because Mm -hmm. I found that character to be so interesting from when I watched Legion. So that kind of helped me with backstory on that character, at least, and knowing what he's capable of. But Katie, do you have a recommendation today? I do. This is, um, uh, I don't know how obscure it is now, but it was pretty indie when I first started reading it. Um, There is a comic writing duo, a pair of brothers called uh, the Luna Brothers, who are Joshua and Jonathan. And um, they their first big thing to get published was called Ultra Seven Days. And it is an eight issue series published around 2004. And each one looks like a different style of magazine. The cover, like one of them looks like a tabloid, one of them like a men's magazine. And it's about uh, superheroes like in their off time. And more about their own personal emotional struggles and the difficulties they have with being superheroes. Um, And it mainly focuses on a couple of women. Okay. And that was so fascinating. And it's, uh, they also did, their next one was Girls, which is much more complicated. (laughs) But this, this one... I really loved and I've read it a few times. I've gone back and opened up my bags like I got to read this one again. So it's definitely worth a shot. Yeah, I've seen their comic Alex and Ada around Mm -hmm. a bit. I don't know anything about it. But as soon as I, you know, went to like, Jonathan's Amazon author page or whatever that popped up and I was like, Oh, okay, so I've, I've definitely heard of at least one thing from this team. And I'm actually going to go with a Rick Remender recommendation, and it's Deadly Class. I'm going to read this mostly for you, Katie, but also for the listeners. So (laughs) Deadly Class is set primarily in the 1980s and follows students enrolled at King's Dominion Atelier of the Deadly Arts. That's not a mouthful at all. A secret boarding school in San Francisco as they train to become the next generation of top assassins for crime families across the globe. Very different from Uncanny X-Force. Incredibly. Kinda. They're still trying to assassinate people in X-Force. Yeah. But the art by Wes Craig, it's fantastic. I really enjoyed the first trade of this. It's one of those ones that I want to get the rest of the trades for. It's just I have 10 more to buy. Oh, God. (laughs) It's 11 trades. So that's a lot. Try volume one. See if you like it. They're also publishing hardcovers. I think if you do the deluxe hardcover route, you're going to end up with four of those and only three are out right now. Okay. Yeah, I... I'm definitely going to have to give that one a try. Who published that? It's an image title. Okay. Excellent. And that shouldn't be too difficult to get. Yeah, that's... What the hell? <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> that was kind of how I felt when I read the first trade, but I was also like, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I love I love stuff that's both confusing and awesome. Yeah. Well, Katie, thank you so much for recommending Uncanny X-Force and for talking about it with me today. Thank you for having me on.